Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Samarjita Mahamarga Ratya Panaka Chatvaram Siktam Gandha Jalai Ruptam Samarjita, thoroughly cleansed, Mahamarga, highways, Ratya, lanes and sub <clears throat> subways, Apanaka, shopping marketplaces, Chatvaram, public meeting places, Shiktam, moistened with, Gandha Jale, scented water, Uptam, was strewn with, Phala, fruits, Pushpa, flowers, Akshata, unbroken, Ankure, seeds. Translation by His Divine Grace, Isi Bhakti Vedanta Swami Srila Prabhupada, Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. The highways, subways, lanes, markets, um, and public meeting places were all thoroughly cleansed and then moistened with scented water. And to welcome the Lord, fruits, flowers, and unbroken seeds were strewn everywhere. Purport. Scented waters prepared by distilling flowers like rose and cura were requis requis requisitioned to wet the roads, streets, and lanes of Dwarkadham. Such places, along with the marketplace and public meeting places, were thoroughly cleansed. From the above description, it appears that the city of Dwarkadham was considerably big, containing many highways, streets, and public meeting places with parks, gardens and reservoirs of water, all very nicely decorated with flowers and fruits. And to welcome the Lord, such flowers and fruits with unbroken seeds of grain were also strewn over the public places. Unbroken seeds of grain or fruits in the seedling stage were considered auspicious, and they are still so used by Hindus in general on festival days. Verse 15, 
द्वारि द्वारि ग्रहाणाम च दध्याक्षत फलेक्षिभि अलंकृताम पूर्ण कुंभैर बलि भीर दूप दीपक है द्वारि द्वारि the door of each and every house grahanam of all the residential buildings cha and dadi curd akshata unbroken phala fruit ikshibihi sugar cane alankritam decorated purna kumbhai full water pots bali bihi along with articles for worship dhupa incense deepakahe <clears throat> with lamps and candles translation in each and every door of the residential houses auspicious things like curd unbroken fruits sugar cane and full water pots with articles for worship incense and candles were all displayed purport the process of reception according to vedic rites is not at all dry the reception was made not simple by decorating the roads and streets as above mentioned but by worshiping the lord with requisite ingredients like incense lamps flowers sweets fruits and other palatable eatables according to one's capacity all were of offered to the lord and the remnants of the food stuff were distributed amongst the gathering citizens so it was not like a dry reception of these modern days each and every house was ready to receive the lord in a similar way and thus each and every house on the roads and streets distributed such remnants of food to the citizens and therefore the festival was successful without distribution of food no function is complete and that is the way of vedic culture verses 16 and 17 nishamsya preshtha mayantam vasudevo mahamanaha अक्रूरश्चोग्रसेनश्चाद्भुत विक्रम प्रद्युम्नश्चारुदेशंभोजाबवती सुता प्रहर्षा वेगोच्छसी शयनाशन भोजन निशम्य जस्ट हिंग प्रेष्ठ द डियर मोस्ट आयत कमिंग होम वसुदेव वसुदेव द फादर ऑफ कृष्ण Mahamanaha, the magnanimous, Akrura, Akrura, Cha, and Ugrasenaha, Ugrasena, Cha, and Ramaha, Balarama, the elder brother of Krishna, Cha, and Adbhutaha, superhuman, Vikramaha, Vikramaha, prowess, Pradyumnaha, Pradyumna, Charu Deshnaha, Charu Deshna, Cha, and Sambaha, Samba, Jambavati Sutaha, the son of Jambavati, Praharsha. extreme happiness vega force uchashita being influenced by shayana lying down asana sitting on bhojana dining translation on hearing that the dear most krishna was approaching dwaraka dham magnanimous vasudeva akrura ugrasena balarama the superhumanly powerful pradyumna charudeshna and samba the son of jambavati all extremely happy abandoned resting sitting and dining purport vasudeva son of king surasena husband of devaki and father of lord shri krishna he is the brother of kunti and father of subhadra subhadra was married with her cousin arjuna and the system still prevails in some parts of india vasudeva was appointed minister of ugrasena and later on he married eight daughters of ugrasena's brother devaka devaki is one of, is only one of them Kamsa was his brother-in-law and Vasudev accepted voluntary imprisonment by Kamsa on mutual agreement to deliver the eighth son of Devaki this was foiled by the will of Krishna as maternal uncle of the Pandavas he took active part in the purificatory process of the Pandavas he sent for the priest Kashyapa at Satan Satashringa Parvataha Parvata and he executed the functions When Krishna appeared within the bars of Kamsa's prison house he was transferred by Vasudev to the house of Nanda Maharaj the foster father of Krishna at Gokul Krishna appeared alongside with Baladev prior to the disappearance of Vasudev and Arjuna Vasudev's nephew undertook the charge of funeral ceremony after Vasudev's disappearance Akrura the commander in chief of the Vrishni dynasty and the great devotee of Lord Krishna 
Akrura attained success and devotional service according to the Lord by one single process of offering prayers. He was the husband of Sutani, daughter of Akuha. He supported Arjuna and when Arjuna took Subhadra forcibly away by the will of Krishna, both Krishna and Akrura went to see Arjuna after his successful kidnapping of Subhadra. Both of them presented dowries to Arjuna after this incident. Akrura was also present when Abhimanyu, the son of Subhadra, was married with Uttara, the mother of Maharaj Parikshit. Akuha, the father of Akrura, was not on good terms with Akrura. Both of them were devotees of the Lord. Agrasena, one of the powerful kings of the Vishnu dynasty and cousin of Maharaj Kunti Bhoja. His other name is Ahuka. His minister was Vasudev and his son was a powerful Kamsa. This Kamsa imprisoned his father and became the king of Mathura. By the grace of Lord Krishna and his brother Lord Baladev, Kamsa was killed and Ugrasena was reinstalled on the throne. When Shalva attacked the city of Dwarka, Ugrasena fought very valiantly and repulsed the enemy. Ugrasena inquired from Naraji about the divinity of Lord Krishna. When the other dynasty was to be vanquished, Ugrasena was entrusted with the iron lump produced from the womb of Samba. He cut the iron lump into pieces and then pasted it and mixed it up with the seawater on the coast of Dwarka. After this, he ordered complete prohibition with this, within the city of Dwarka and the kingdom. He got salvation after his death. Baladev, he's the, son of divine, he's the divine son of Vasudev by his wife Rohini. He's also known as Rohini Nandana, the beloved son of Rohini. He was also entrusted to Nanda Maharaj along with his mother Rohini when Vasudev embraced imprisonment by mutual agreement with Kamsa. So Nanda Maharaj is also the foster father of Baladev along with Lord Krishna. Lord Krishna and Lord Balaram were constant companions from their very childhood, although they were powerful although they were stepbrothers. He is the plenary manifestation of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, and therefore he is as good and powerful as Lord Krishna. He belongs to the Vishnu Tattva, the principal of Godhead. He attended the Swayamvara cer ceremony of Draupadi along with Sri Krishna. When Subhadra was kidnapped by Arjuna by the organized plan of Sri Krishna, Baladev was very angry with Arjuna and wanted to kill him at once. Sri Krishna, for the sake of his dear friend, fell at the feet of Lord Baladev and implored him not to be so angry. Sri Baladev was thus satisfied. Mm -hmm. Similarly, he was, he was once very angry with the Kauravas and he wanted to throw their whole city into the depths of the Yamuna. But the Kauravas satisfied him by surrendering unto his divine lotus feet. He was actually the seventh son of Devaki prior to the birth of Lord Krishna. But by the will of the Lord, he was transferred to the womb of the Rohini to escape the wrath of Kamsa. His other name um, is therefore Sankarshan, who is also the plenary portion of Sri Baladev. Because he's as powerful as Lord Krishna and can bestow spiritual powers to the devotees, he's therefore known as Baladev. In the Vedas, it is also enjoined that no one can know the Supreme Lord without being favored by Baladev. Bala means spiritual strength, not physical. Some less intelligent persons interpret Bala as a strength of the body, but no one can have spiritual realization by physical strength. Physical strength ends with the end of the physical body, but spiritual strength follows the spirit soul to the next transmigration, and therefore the strength obtained by Baladev is never wasted. The strength is eternal, and thus Baladev is the original spiritual master of all devotees. Sri Baladev was also a class friend of Lord Sri Krishna as a student of Sandipani Muni. In his childhood, he killed many asuras along with Sri Krishna, and specifically, he killed the Denukasura at Talavan. During the Kurukshetra battle, he remained neutral and he tried his best not to bring about the fight. He was in favor of Duryodhana, but still, he remained neutral. When there was a club fight between Duryodhana and Bhimasena, he was present on the spot. He was angry at Bhimasena when the latter struck Duryodhana on the thigh or below the belt, and he wanted to retaliate the unfair action. Lord Sri Krishna saved Bhima from his wrath. But he left the place at once being disgusted at Bhimasena, and after his departure, Duryodhana fell to the ground to meet his death. The funeral ceremony of Abhimanyu, the son of Arjuna, was performed by him, as he was the maternal uncle. It was impossible to be performed by any one of the Pandava, Pandavas who were, who were all overwhelmed with grief. At the last stage, he departed from this world by producing a great white snake from his mouth, and thus he was carried by Seshanaga, the snake, in the, in the shape of a serpent. Pradyumna, 
incarnation of Kamadev, or according to others, incarnation of Sanat Kumara, born as a son of, pers of the personality of Godhead, Lord Sri Krishna and Lakshmi Devi, Srimati Rukmini, the principal queen at Dwarka. He was one of those who went to congratulate Arjuna upon marrying Subhadra. He was one of the great generals who fought with Salva, and while fighting with him, he became unconscious on the battlefield. His charioteer brought him back to the camp from the battlefield, and for this action, he was very sorry and rebuked his charioteer. However, he fought again with Shalva and was victorious. He heard all about the different demigods from Naraji. He's one of the four plenary expansions of Lord Sri Krishna. He's the third one. He inquired from his father, Sri Krishna, about the glories of the Brahmanas. During the fratricidal war amongst the descendants of Yadu, he died at the hand of Bhoja, another king of the Vrishnis. After his death, he was installed in his original position. Charudeshna, another son of Lord Krish Sri Krishna and Rukmini Devi. He was also present during the Swayambar ceremony of Draupadi. He was a great warrior like his brothers and father. He fought with Vividhaka, Vividhaka and killed him in the fight. Shamba, one of the great heroes of the Yadu dynasty and the son of Lord Sri Krishna by his wife, Jambavati. He learned the military art of throwing arrows from Arjuna and he became a member of parliament during the time of Maharaj Yudhishthir. He was present during, during the Rajashuri Yagna of Maharaj Yudhishthir. When all the Vrishnis were assembled during the time of Prabhasa Yagna, his glorious activities were narrated by Satyaki before Lord Baladev. He was also present along with his father, Lord Sri Krishna, during the Ashwamedha Yagna performed by Yudhishthir. He was present before some rishis falsely dressed as a pregnant woman by his brothers, and in fun, he asked the rishis what he was going to deliver. The rishis replied that he would deliver a lump of iron, which would be the cause of the fratricidal war and the family of, the, of Yadu. The next day, in the morning, Samba delivered a large lump of iron, which was entrusted to Ugrasena for necessary action. Actually, later on, there was the foretold fratricidal war, and Samba died in that war. So all these sons of Lord Krishna left their respective palaces, and leaving aside all engagements, including lying down, sitting, and dining, hastened towards their exalted father. Om Agnanati Mirandasya, Gnananjana Shalaka, Chakshurun Militam Yena, Tasmai Shri Kurvenamha, Shri Chaitanya Manubhishtam, Staptam Yena Bhutale, Swayam Rupa Kadama, Him Dadati Swapadandikam, Bandeham Shri Guru, Shri Yutapadakamalam, Shri Guru Vaishnavamscha, Sri Rupam Sagrajatam, Sahagana Raghunathan Vitam, Tam Sajivam, Sadvaitam, Savadutam, Parijana Sahitam, Krishna Chaitanya Devam, Shri Radha Krishna Padan, Sahagana Lakitan, Shri Vishakham Vitamscha. हे कृष्णा करुणा सिंधु दीन बंधु जगत पते गोपेशा गोपिका कांता राधा कांता नमोस्तुते तप्त कांचन गौरांगी राधे वृंदावनेश्वरी विश्वभानु सुते देवी प्रणमामि हरि प्रिय वांचा कल्पतरुभ्यस्य कृपा सिंधुभ्य एवचा पतितानां पावनेभ्यो वैष्णवेभ्यो नमो नमः श्री कृष्ण चैतन्य प्रभु नित्यानंद श्री अद्वैत गदाधार श्री वासदी गौरभक्त वृंद हरे कृष्ण हरे कृष्ण 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे हरे मुखम करोति वाचाला पंगम लंगेते गिरम यत कृपात महम वंदे श्री गुरु दिनतारिणम परमानंद माधवम श्री चैतन्य ईश्वरम नमः हरे कृष्णा थैंक यू डियर डिवोटीज फॉर बीइंग हियर टुडे बीइंग प्रेजेंट गिविंग मी योर सपोर्ट एंड होपफुली ब्लेसिंग्स um सो आई कैन डू जस्टिस टू दीस वर्सेस एंड शेयर um my limited realizations. Um, I'll start um, speaking about the 14th verse um, slightly. Um, so in this, um, Srila Prabhupada talks about um, scented waters prepared by distilling flowers like rose and cure. Um, recently, we had um, the celebration, the golden jubilee of um, the Queen of England. And um, we, we noticed that although, um, you know, different parts celebrated it differently, I noticed a lot of flags um, were decorated. There was um, a lot of specials. And from a commercial point of view, uh, there were so many sales. There were so many offers. There were so many 
various different what seem like celebrations um, for a festival um, being offered. And this idea um, comes from um, our celebration of you know, festivals from the Vedic civilization. Um, we say, you know, every day is a festival, every you know, word is a song, every step is a dance. And often we see that this is the case, um, you know, when we surround ourselves with devotees, we're, we're living in a Vedic civilization of life. Um, we need a celebration every day uh, to celebrate the Supreme Personality of Godhead, uh, to celebrate our life, to celebrate um, our love and devotion, to celebrate being with each other, being amongst each other, uh, serving with each other. And all these are really, really important because they make us realize that we're not alone. Um, I once heard a lecture in which um, the speaker said, if God is everywhere, then why do we go to places of worship? Um, and it got me thinking, and it is true. We, we dress a certain way. We go to a place of worship. Um, yes, because, you know, the Archavigraha of Krishna is there for us to see his, um, you know, form in, in that form, in the deity form, and to worship him. But also, more importantly, for our own sake, um, to feel that sense of community, to feel that sense of belonging, to feel that sense of we're not alone in this journey, um, you know, which can be hard sometimes. Um, devotional service has its ups and downs, um, as does everything else. But in knowing that we're not alone and knowing that we have the support of each other to lift each other when we're low, to celebrate each other, and the center of our object of affection, which is the Lord, um, with each other together, uh, magnifies uh, the happiness, the joy, and um, and everything else. And and we learn so much from each other. Um, if it weren't for uh, all our Vaishnava acharyas and Srila Prabhupada, we would we wouldn't know how it is that we celebrate, what it is that Krishna likes, what it is that um, they did in Vedic civilization. Uh, to celebrate um, his every moment, his existence, Krishna's, you know, appearance. Um, so scented waters were prepared by distilling flowers. Um, the commercial aspect, the today's aspect is, you know, we've got perfumes, we've got stuff that makes us smell good, um, that purifies, well, seemingly makes the atmosphere smell good. Uh, but the key here that I picked up is um, also cleaning um, the streets, um in vedic civilization they swept the you know with a broom they swept the streets every day then they sprinkled um water that was mixed with cow dung um you know for its purificatory medicinal properties and paved the way um, it also shows how mother cow was the center of so many auspicious activities so um and that was done and then beautiful rangolis um were uh, were made, um, you know, one more beautiful than the other, not as a competition, but just in the attempt to please the Lord. Um, and here we see that distilling flowers. So now in these days, you know, there's a, a lot of demand for essential oils and, you know, pure oils and distilling flowers and not doing it by mechanical means. And all this comes from the Vedic civilization where all these instructions are clearly given, scented waters being prepared to wet the roads. Um, and the key thing is here, we've got paved roads and everything. Back in the day, they didn't have that, which means there was a lot of dust and sand. So all these, the streets and the roads were wet, so the dust didn't rise. And it provided a cool uh, when, when the earth was hot. All these flowers uh, or the distilled um, waters, then scented waters, then the aroma then rose and, you know, it created an atmosphere of, you know, beautiful smelling stuff um, and that atmosphere of welcoming the Lord. Um, let's not forget that, you know, Krishna is worshipped in the Aishwarya uh, Bhav or Aishwarya mood in the Dham. So, a lot of it here is awe and reverence and setting the standard for, um, you know, the marketplaces, public meeting places, 
um, as to how it should be, um, you know, to set the stage for uh, all other cities as to how Dwarka should be um, and how all other cities in India should be. Um, the city of Dwarka town was considerably big. So the idea of, you know, us thinking that we're somehow a civilized society in a developed country. No, Dwarka Dam was, you know, considerably big, contained many, many highways, public meeting places, parks, gardens, reservoirs of water. Um, water that was available to not only for aesthetic purposes, but for people to drink, for travelers, for tourists who pass from city to city as part of their Padayatra to stop and drink and enjoy that water, to enjoy the scenic uh, uh, routes, to enjoy the sceneries of beautiful flowers and fruit trees decorated. It's very aesthetically pleasing to the eyes and our senses um, and all the um, very nicely decorated with flowers and fruits. So in modern civilization, um, at least until a, you know maybe a few years ago, uh, there were cities that actually had flowers and fruit trees that travelers could stop and eat. But as Kaliyoga progresses, we don't want people to have free access to anything. One, because the government somehow feels, uh, or the city feels, oh, it's such a big mess that we have to clean up. And who's going to do all this cleaning? Who decides who gets how many fruits? And um, you know who maintains uh, if the fruits are worthy of eating? What if somebody eats those fruits? And what if they sue us and they fall sick? And there's so many aspects to think about. Whereas back in the day, things were simple in a Vedic civilization. You had these fruits and flower fruits, especially um, you know, um, for people to have access to it, um, for people to be able to offer it to the Lord anywhere and everywhere. The Lord says in the Bhagavad Gita, you know, Pashpam, uh, Patram Pushpam Palam Toyam, um, to be able to access these anywhere and everywhere. So you don't have to run to a store, buy it, come back and then offer it. You're able to offer it. So as the Lord is walking on the on the streets of Dwarka, you know, these are ways to welcome him. These are ways to offer stuff to him. The Lord might not go into everybody's house, but everybody's offering is just as honest, just as genuine, and just as one-to-one -one in a way that they feel that their Krishna is coming into their homes, into their hearts. And by imbibing that mood by having everything in such a level in such a state that the Lord is able to accept your purity is able to accept everything that you offer with love um, you know that all these things are made available and uh, I'm reading parts of the purport here and um, sort of switching between my realizations and to welcome the Lord with such flowers and fruit with unbroken seeds of grain that were also strewn over the public places. So unbroken seeds here of grain refers to, you know, um, mostly rice, rice grains, you know, that are unbroken. They're, they're called akshata. And akshata has a major significance in Vedic worship. Um, you can have um, akshata as unbroken grains of rice. It can go, you can, you can make an offering uh, with it to the deity and our, our shastras actually state that akshata can actually replace flowers if you don't have any, water if you don't have any, um, which I know we offer all these as part of when we offer puja, when we do a yajna, but um, should devotees find themselves in a place where you don't have um, fresh items, of all these available, um, you can actually offer uh, akshata as an alternative to flowers. And it, it's actually a boon because um, that is one thing that you can hold in your hand and offer, uh, uh, make, make a, what's the word I'm looking for? Have a prayer and offer that as, um, as an offering. So devotees often tend to spring akshatas, you know, on auspicious occasions. I know Hindus use that, you know, mixed with turmeric. They use that as blessings, you know, in weddings. Um, the idea is that the demigods and everybody else is blessing you. You're blessing them. Um, and um, obviously religious significance is um, uh, that the akshata, which is the unbroken grain of rice, can attract um, 
all five principles of the deities, um, which is, you know, the different demigods. Um, and they have really special vibrations. And um, uh, when you offer it in prayer, uh, there are three types of prayer, which is, you know, manasika, which is, you know, one that you offer with your mind. Vachika is one that you offer, you know, recitation of mantras. And the last one is um, the worship, it's called kaika. And um, all these are offered uh, with the uh, Deepa, Dhupa, Gandha, which is um, sandalwood, Pushpa, uh, flowers, um, and um, so many other things like Bilva Patra and uh, all these. And these are offered uh, in different yagnas. Um, the Akshata has um, also the importance, they, they contain the vibrations of a deity. And at the end of the puja, these Akshatas are donated to Brahmanas. Ideally, this is the essence of, you know, um, every puja, every every um, sacrifice that's done. Um, we'll move on. So, yeah, unbroken seeds of grains and fruits in the seedling stage were considered very auspicious um, because at this stage they're very pure. And um, also the, the riper they get, um, different animals and different life forms start to sort of penetrate them and eat them and taste them, which is why at the seedling stage, they're considered really, really auspicious and um, they're offered on festival days. Um, I'm moving on to the next verse, um, Dwari Dwari Grihanamcha. Uh, the process of reception according to Vedic rites is not at all dry. Um, we, we are a testament to that because when we have a festival, um, you know, as devotees, um, we, 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 we dedicate, we uh, delegate different aspects of service, different departments of service, um, so everybody can do their best and we come together and it becomes a huge success and a huge big festival. Um, the reception was not made simple by decorating the roads and streets, by worshiping the Lord with requisite ingredients like incense, lamps, flowers, and according to one's capacity. And I think this is the most important key here. You know, Krishna is called Bhava Grahi Janardana, which means according to one's own capacity, according to one's own consciousness, it's really important uh, that we focus on that um, because oftentimes we feel that, yes, you know, Krishna uh, as, as the king, as the Dwaraka Vasi, Dwaraka Dish, you know, you want to give him all sorts of opulences, all sorts of, you know, jewelry, richness, you know, pick the best flowers, and we should pick the best fruits, pick the, pe pick the best of everything, but what is affordable according to one's capacity. Um, in Vedic civilization, everybody, you know, offered a certain part of their income. Um, they didn't have salary, but a certain part of their income, their earnings um, towards, um, um, towards Krishna, towards, you know, the offering to the Lord in different capacities. Um, and some, you know, different people offered, some people offered their services, uh, some people offered their money, some people offered the basics of what they had. We see that Sudama Brahmana, um, Sudama Vipra offered just a handful of flattened rice and that's all he could offer. And yet Krishna ate that with so much delight and happiness, you know, to the point where tears were streaming down his eyes. So this according to one's capacity is so important here because often in this competition, in this world where, you know, we tend to look external, externally for motivation, we look at different people, you know, on social media um, and, um, you know, in different offerings, doing their best, whether, you know, financially, um, in terms of buying stuff for Krishna. And sometimes it can make us feel like, oh, you know, I can't afford that. So I'll, I'll sit back. Um, but the key thing is the Lord wants your love and devotion. He wants our love and devotion. He wants that bhakti. And that bhakti is a two-way street. So when you offer that love, you know, then Krishna offers his presence in our heart in a way that we feel that presence in a way that we feel inspired to do more, to give more. And um, that doesn't necessarily have to do with, um, you know, spending a lot of money. Um, there's often this tale uh, that I heard 
please don't quote me on this, where there's two friends and they were supposed to go to uh, a Bhagavatam class, Krishna Katha. But one of them made, you know, um, gave their word to somebody before about, you know, um, going to another place. So we have person A who now goes to Krishna Katha and person B who due to their promise goes to a, a karmi function. And this person A who's at Krishna Katha is constantly thinking, oh, I wonder what my other friend is doing. So even though he's physically present, he's mentally absent. Whereas this other person who's physically present at, you know, say a karmi gathering is mentally thinking, oh, Hari, I'm missing out on Krishna Katha. So, so that feeling of, you know, that bhava, that, you know, that's what Krishna sees. And Krishna knows our capacity. If I can offer this much, but I choose to part with this much, and if I skimp on my offerings to Krishna, but, you know, on the other end, I'm able to enjoy or eat or reap the benefits of my material um, um, opulence, then Krishna sees that. Whereas I'm living within my capacity and I offer the best of what I have to Krishna, Krishna sees that too. Um, the key thing is all were offered to the Lord and the remnants of foodstuff were distributed amongst the gathered, gathering citizens. This is such a key point in our movement and Srila Prabhupada stresses that from the very beginning of having prasadam, you know, the remnants, the mercy, of the foodstuff that we offer to the Lord. Um, oftentimes, um, you know, when I came to devotional service um, in um, the movement, I loved prasadam and believe it or not, that was one of the very first ways in which I transitioned and my heart was purified, my, you know, the body and then the heart and then the mind gets purified. Um, and at the time, I remember that uh, my, mo my mother and sister were eating something different to what I was eating. And I said, oh, you know, um, what are you eating? And they said, oh, you know, we're eating, you know, Ekadasi Prasadam, um, nothing fancy. Today's just a little special, so we're eating something different. And that really appealed to me because um, for me, it was really hard initially to come to terms of being a devotee and understanding Krishna consciousness. My false ego wouldn't allow it. So when I read Srila Prabhupada's books, and he was calling everybody rascals. I was like, oh, this is too much for me. Yeah. But when I started eating prasadam that was offered and I started thinking, oh, you know, this is, this is not bad. And I realized that that, that day was Ekadasi. And that's how even before I started being a devotee, I started, you know, observing Ekadasi. Whereas sometimes some devotees are able to accept it um, from the tattva point of view, you know, Krishna as the supreme personality of Godhead, Krishna stu Bhagavan Swayam, and it appeals to their intelligence. And some people, you know, come to our path that way through books, and these amazing books make their ways into the homes and hearts. Uh, of people through so many avenues, you know, books that end up in trash cans or dustbins, people pick up and start to read books that are left in a library, people pick up and start to read books that are sat, you know, gathering cobwebs and dust. Suddenly now, you know, people are attracted to it and they start reading and that's one path that they come. Krishna talks about these four paths that one comes to devotional service in the Bhagavad Gita. Um, but the most important one being one that, you know, wants to seek me with love and devotion. Um, so coming back to the prasadam aspect, it's so important. And that is why a Ratyatra festival um, that we're gearing up to is so important because whether people believe in, you know, of you know, love of God, whether people have the intelligence to understand at that moment, the, um, the, the preaching aspect of, you know, uh, understanding why it is important, why it's important to not be in this um, body and why this body doesn't last forever, so on and so forth. But everybody eats, whether you're happy, whether you're sad, whether there's a death, whether there's a birth, whether there's a celebration, um, all aspects, people eat. 
And it is so important because this, that food nourishes the body, that food nourishes our soul, that food is um, one of the ways by which, you know, cheto darpanam arjanam, you know, you cleanse your heart, um, you cleanse your soul of the dust of ignorance, you know, avidya accumulated for, you know, millions and millions and millions of lifetimes. So that food stuff is so important. And so is the consciousness by which we cook that food. So is the consciousness by which we offer that food and, um, you know, and, and distributing that food. And um, I, you know, which also talks about the Ayurvedic aspect because um, food that is cooked, you know, um, Ayurveda talks about it as, this, um, you know, our Shastras, food that is not cooked more than, you know, four hours. Um, so when we're offering that food, it's no longer stale, it's no longer uh, not offerable, you know, it's, um, it's fresh, it's palatable, it's, um, it's tasty, it doesn't need to be heated and reheated in a way that it loses its uh, taste, and freshness by which uh, it was cooked, um, which is why it's so important for us to cook it um, and offer it and then honor it within a certain time period. Um, there's so many, um, you know, I know Prabhupada talks so much about um, Ayurvedic aspect as well, you know, Prabhupada was a, as an expert and on so many aspects of um, Vedic society, Vedic life. And um, he, he talks about what foods to eat, when to eat, how to honor them and eating them fresh and proper, um, you know, in the different lectures and, and the different interactions that we read with um, the initial proper devotees, disciples, they talk about how Prabhupada liked his food hot. Um, Prabhupada ate a certain amount. And if he didn't eat it hot, you know, he just lost his appetite. Um, so it's it's important for us to remember this uh, while cooking for ourselves, to offer at home to our deities, um, at cooking at the temple. This is a this is the foremost service that we can offer to ourselves and everybody else um, is, you know, cooking the right food. Um, and offering it in time and offering good quality produce to Krishna. Um, so moving on, every house was ready to receive the Lord, um, remnants of food to citizens. Another really key point is um, Vedic civilization actually talks about whenever uh, somebody decided to eat food, we, we noticed this in the case of um, Maharaj Ambarish as well, you know, once he's uh, ready to break his fast, He's sitting down and um, he's got tons, you know, loads of brahmanas, you know, giving food to brahmanas and actually announcing everybody used to announce outside their house that, you know, I'm about to have prasadam. Is there anybody that would like to have or share this prasadam? And all these, this, the sharing, this offering um, food, water to uh, making that available to people who would, um, you know, travel from one city to the other because, you know, back in the day, they didn't have modes of different modes of transport, and people chose to walk. Padayatra was um, was was an end thing, and um, and offering this service, you know, saying that I am about to eat. Is there anybody that would like to come eat that prasadam? Um, just shows the mood of the citizens and devotees. Um, so we're distributed, remnants of uh, uh, food were distributed to the citizens and therefore the festival was, a, was successful. Um, without distribution of food, no function is complete and that is the way of Vedic culture. So as you notice, you know, every single one of our festivals um, has a major, major feast. Um, there's so much centered around food. It's, it's, it's a celebration, um, the different preparations, the different, um, um, types of food, you know, um, um, the Samsara Davanala prayers um, talks about the four different types of food, you know, one that you can chew, uh, one that you can suck, one that you can bite, so on and so forth. So um, our, our Shastras offer us a lot of information um, on that front. Um, I've got a couple of other points as well um, here um, on, on those lines. Um, people back in the day were really proud of um, this setup that is having these fruit trees, having these flower trees that determined the consciousness of the civilization back then. And this time and age, we don't have anything on our highways. We've got a lot of stuff to protect us from the speeding cars, um, the nature of 
you know, the fast paced life. And that's, believe it or not, that's where a lot of our diseases also come from, from an Ayurvedic point of view, you know, um, traveling, our bodies are not made to travel at such high speeds from one place to another. Yes, they serve as well. Yes, that's the only way we can travel. Um, if we had to walk or take a boat or ship to Vrindavan, we probably wouldn't make it in this lifetime all the way from here. Um, and But that probably makes us appreciate it even more. Um, so our bodies are not made um, to sit in chairs. Our bodies are not made to sit in boxes that we call cubicles at work. Our bodies are not made to live in these you know storied houses where we're so disconnected from mother earth we're not grounding we're not um, in touch with our roots our base and um and that's and, and surrounded by obviously you know so many electronics you know different uh, radiations and and that's key so that civilization back in the day you know they were they were proud of the the beautiful trees their highways um that they had to, you know, that were paved with uh, both aesthetically pleasing stuff and stuff that people could benefit, you know, um, that you could sit under the shade of the tree, you could eat the fruit of the tree, you could take a nap. Um, there's a beautiful picture of Prabhupada taking a nap under a tree uh, as, as he was traveling through, through parts of India. And nobody ever naps under trees anymore. Uh, uh, but the key point is, trees especially certain trees like mango um have, have any of you ever wondered um if you've ever lived in india during festivals they actually have mango leaves on the entrance of each doorway and i don't know for the longest time because you know it's you do it because whether it's a cultural thing whether it's a superstitious thing when you're growing up you're thinking they're all the same you know you just you just do it but as you grow up as we understand more and more about Vedic culture, Vedic civilization and Krishna consciousness, we understand the meaning of all these things. Um, mango leaves, tender mango leaves actually give out oxygen, fresh oxygen. So they, they eliminate, they remove all, you know, the inauspiciousness, uh, they remove all the, uh, anyway, by giving oxygen, they, it adds a certain, um, extra factor to the festivities, to that area. Um, and, and, and I didn't know that for the longest time, especially mango leaves. Um, it's called a thoranam um, in, um, in South India where I come from. So how civilization has changed over the years is something you know that we really need to be mindful of. Um, today, you know, everybody's like, oh, back to back to Vedic culture, back to Vedic civilization. And most devotees that I talk to, you know, Prabhupada has so much emphasis on growing your own food because we understand we're connected with our food. Um, you know, you can chant to the trees. Prabhupada says if nobody's there, chant to the trees, you know. So chanting to our plants, um, being around them when we chant, you are directly impacting the consciousness of the fruit, the flower, the vegetable that is being grown. Um, <clears throat> having these auspicious vibrations of uh, the holy name, um, so being surrounded by it is so, so, so important for this reason. Um, so being in touch with our fruit, the food that we grow, and then offering it fresh. Um, we're so disconnected. I was asking my child the other day, I said, what do we eat? And she said, we eat plants. And I said, how about animals? She's like, no, no, they've got feelings. And I said, where does our food come from? And in my head, I was thinking plants and, you know, the forest. But in her head, she was thinking, oh, from Tesco. And it was such a valid point. You know, it reminded me that children see and understand things differently. Uh, when we don't have an input, when we don't explain to them where that food comes from, which is why it's so important for them to see that, you know, this is how um, coriander can be grown. And these are things that we can grow at home easily. This is how um, a potato can be grown. These are vegetables that grow underground. These are vegetables that grow above the ground. These are, these are the plants you know we eat their different parts of the plants that we use utilize in um, making prasadam and making boga um, 
I think it's important for us to be connected with that food as well, because it means that we're not paying for commercially produced food, which is bad for the environment. Um, my food comes from Spain. I, I don't live in Spain, but we don't have the ability to grow our own food just yet. But if we tried uh, little by little, just like we grow flowers for Radha Madhav, <clears throat> Hopefully someday, um, you know, Krishna willing, uh, Lester um, Yatra can have its own produce um, to serve Radha Madhav and eventually expand to the rest of the devotee community. Um, so civilization back in the day had, you know, they were, they had an aim, they knew what, uh, what to eat according to seasons. For example, um, there's a drink called Panaka, which is made during Ramanavami. Ramanavami during in India is usually a time when uh, the it's it's hot, the warm weather starts, summer's picking up, it starts to get really really warm, and um, this drink is made that's cooling to the body. Uh, mind you, they didn't have fridges, refrigerators, and Vedic society. They had earthen pots, and they had spices that they use to cool the body, um, not cold stuff but spices that cool the body without hampering your digestion. Um, so I thought that was really, really interesting. So um, you have, um, you know, the panaka, which is offered, you know, in the summer, there's a specific drink. Um, then um, even your ekadasis, there's a satila ekadasi that comes at a time where, you know, we celebrate Sankranti, where the cold weather is going and the warm weather is coming in. But, um, we're, we're in the seasonal santi, which is, you know, where two seasons, um, winter and summer meet, um, springtime. So you eat, it's okay to eat sesame seeds, you know, to build that warmth, um, to keep that warmth in your body and to welcome, you know, to carefully transition your body. So um, when you start to understand the importance of different aspects of, you know, what we do in Vedic society, in Vedic civilization, it makes so much more sense. And then these will be things that you can never forget again, whether or not you remember the essence of Satilaitadasi, the essence of celebrating Ramanavami, or um, reading a verse to understand why um, we do what we do. Um, this is also a good time uh, to um, tell you this one story that Kadambakanana Swami uh, mentioned in one of his lectures, amazing, amazing lecture. But this one part really stood out for me. And he talks about how to tell the difference between a superstition and, you know, something that's cultural. So there was this lady who unfortunately lost her husband, you know, at a young age, and she had a daughter. And um, she, you know, she raised this daughter, you know, with the utmost care, love, did everything right, gave her the best of everything that she could offer. And um, she had a massive sort of complex that, oh my God, you know, I'm a single mother. I really have to, you know, I, I don't want my daughter to feel the aspect of, oh, had I, if I had a father, things would have been different. So she did everything, you know, uh, wedding preparations, having everything for the uh, other party, the, the groom side. Um, you know, making sure no stone was left unturned. Perfect, perfect. On the day of the wedding, um, while everything was going on and she was running around, she noticed that there was a black cat. And she's like, oh my God, I wonder what this means. It's so inauspicious. But in her quick thinking, she took a, a, a bamboo basket, you know, like, uh, uh, and then she put it on top of the cat so nobody would see the cat. And um, and then she went about and then, you know, she was like, oh, you know, praying to the Lord. Oh, Lord, you know, and everything went perfectly. Her daughter's wedding was perfect. Everything. Everybody was happy. The food was great. Everything went perfectly. And there, you know, she became old and, you know, eventually left this body. And her daughter, you know, um, now has, you know, her own two kids. She raised them. And when her first child, her first daughter was getting married, she did everything perfectly, just like her mom, you know, um, ch children do what we do, do what they see, not, you know, uh, what we tell them to. So learn from her mom, learn everything prim and proper, perfect. But on the day of the wedding, 
right when the groom was about to come, everybody said, oh, you've got everything ready. Her husband's like, you know, did you do this, this, this? Yes, yes, everything's done. And the very last minute she goes, oh, I forgot something. I forgot something. And she goes and gets a black cat and puts it in the corner and puts a basket on top of it. And I thought that was, that was hilarious. And Marge explains that she thought that that was the reason her life and her marriage was successful because her mother decided to put that inauspicious, seemingly inauspicious black cat in that corner. Um, uh, and uh, so Marge talks about how superstitions without knowing when we do something, it then becomes a superstition. It just becomes this fanatical, oh, I have to do this, but why? Oh, I don't know. So the onus lies on us, especially as devotees to understand the words of the Acharyas, to understand um, these conversations between the pure devotees, the Vaishnavas, and to um, interpret them with their help and um, apply that in our everyday lives um, by understanding the meaning and essence of what it means to be a devotee. Because um, often, you know, again, I notice this with my children, you know, um, when we when we get something and I say, oh, how do we offer? Um, she knows how to ring a bell. But when she told me, I said, how do you offer? She says, oh, I, I know how to offer. Shri Vishnu, Shri Vishnu, Shri Vishnu. And then that's when I realized that you know, for a child, it's it's very easy to sit there and pick something that's easy because they're so excited in their excitement of wanting to eat something. They could say that this might be the easier way. But as parents, as devotees, and as ones that who understand the impact of um, eating prasadam that's cooked and offered properly, we should offer to the Lord with all our love and devotion um, in a state that that prasadam could then serve to nourish our body. Um, I, will, I, will, I will briefly touch on the last two verses, which um, talk, I know, extensively about these amazing personalities. Um, and uh, the key point that I thought here was, um, on hearing that the most dear Krishna was approaching Dwaraka Tham, Magnanimous Vasudev, Akruda, Grusena Balaram, all extremely abandoned their resting, sitting and dining. Uh, the word that is used here in the verse is uh, vego. Vego um, is the the force. Uh, Sanskrit is such a beautiful language. Here it talks about the uh, the force. It says um, in a different place and the nectar of instructions. Vega talks about the urge. Um, so the urgency with which they got up and they left whatever they were doing to move on, to run, pardon me, and to welcome uh, the Supreme Lord is one that, um, that, that, should, that should stick with us because um, all, the, all the really um, important, not important, sorry, opulent devotees like the Pandavas, they had all the opulence in the world, uh, Maharaj Ambarish, uh, Kula Shekhar Alvar, you know, they had all the material opulences, but yet they took shelter of the Lord, the humility, the love and devotion by which they approached the Lord and his devotees is unparalleled. Um, and sometimes our false ego doesn't allow it, you know, we're thinking, oh, but I am a devotee too. I've been in the movement X amount of years and somebody should, you know, recognize me, offer, you know, their uh, welcome to me. Um, but if we check our false ego and think that if we feel that way, with our limited opulences and our limited skills, um, then let's remind ourselves that Krishna, who's the possessor of all the opulences, you know, what should be our state of mind and mood by which we receive him. Um, so that's obviously described here in this verse that, you know, when Krishna is approaching Dwaraka Dham, everybody just drops whatever they're doing and runs to them. Um, obviously, this um, purport, um, verses 16 and 17, have so much in them, content in them, that talk about um, why uh, the end of the Vrishni dynasty, why the Yadus have to be um, eliminated, uh, for lack of a better word, why that has to come to an end, because they were becoming more powerful. And Krishna wanted um, for that dynasty to you know come to an end but because of his love and attachment to the yadu as being a yadu himself he didn't know how to do that and um 
um, it so happened that um, that um, you know Samba dressed himself and went to the rishis and um, as a prank. Uh, if anything we learn from history, it's uh, never to prank rishis. It never ends well, uh, and brahmanas. So um, uh, this this verse is loaded, and my apologies that we've run out of time um, um, to discuss this. But um, hopefully, um, uh, we can all read this and understand the importance of these famous personalities and why. In the purpose, Srila Prabhupada talks about who they are, you know, reminding us who they are, who is this personality. Um, you know, some little Priya Sundari somewhere in Leicester is giving class and Prabhu had, you know, more lines to say about me than I have about these famous personalities. Um, but it just shows you that um, through Srila Prabhupada, through the devotees, we understand that these famous personalities, every single one of them, um, whether they're a plenary expansion, whether they're a son of the Lord, whether they're an expansion of the Lord or the Lord themselves, have so much importance and um, they carry such a huge responsibility and um, 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 you know um, they're, they're such main characters in our story um, so I will end with that I apologize for going over if anybody has any questions um, I will leave um, the forum open now for those Hare Krishna devotees, uh, I request all of you to come forward and ask questions or share any comments or realizations you have. Thank you, Murnali Radhika Mataji, for your comment. Um, it's really nice to note that um, we're growing flowers for Shishi Radha Mata. If anybody feels like you're not able to comment now or have any questions, if you see me later, please, please, by all means, um, you know, the Sunday program, please give me feedback, whether in person or hear about how I can improve my service. Yes, Mother, it looks like everyone is happy and content. I thank you so much for your amazing insights um, on how Prabhupada emphasized on cooking and offering. Um, honoring fresh food and also the Ay Ay Ayurvedic way, which was very naturally embedded in the Vedic civilization. Prabhupada's vision of developing farm communities and goshalas, yeah. <laughs> and especially the analogy you gave of uh, two friends uh, was very powerful, which teaches us to consciously stay connected with the divine um, during our busy lives. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mataji.